the illustrious Triple Crown. Three legs of motorsport glory, three different disciplines. That's what the 24 hours of Le Mans, the Indy 500, and the Monaco Grand Prix all have in common. What's unique to the Indy 500 is it requires crossing the Atlantic to take a shot at it, which is no easy task logistically speaking. But even once you get here, you have the challenge of the oval ahead of you. Many have tried their hand and failed at the enormously difficult task. In fact, one stands alone among the rest of motorsport competitors who has won all three legs. Fernando Alonso could change all of that, and he has his work cut out for him. Unlike in Formula 1, where slicing through the field is very much dependent on the power you boast, ovals are different, and setups matter a great deal. Only 10 times has a driver qualified worse than 20th and still gone on to win. That number dramatically shrinks to just a couple of times post-1936. Difficult indeed. But there's always a chance. And it's not just Alonso facing nearly impossible odds. Penske has three of their previous Indy 500 champions fighting from beyond 20th place, as Will Power, Simon Paginot, and Helio Castroneves start from 22nd, 25th, and 28th. But those four have something else in common aside from having their work cut out for them in the 104th running of the Indy 500. They all have competed in the FIA career ladder in a form of Formula Series racing with gradations of success. Where they deviate is Alonso doesn't have a full-time ride for the 2020 season. So why is Alonso running in the event as a one-off? Some people are turned off by what Alonso is doing, deeming him a distraction from other indie standouts. And while from the outside looking in, that's understandable, this video will explain why that's not the case. In an attempt to really immerse myself and truly understand how everyone else was taking this, I connected with other motorsport channels to see how they were actually interpreting this, and I think Slapshoes puts it best. He obviously has a lot of respect for the Indy 500 and all of its history, or else he wouldn't be here for the third time trying to make the show. And that's spot on. So here today, we're going to be talking specifically about the history of Formula 1 drivers competing in the Indy 500, and the surprising facts, data, and stories behind past and current drivers that proves what Fernando Alonso is doing is far from unique. The Indianapolis 500 is significantly older than the Formula 1 championships, with Grand Prix racing being held leading up to the inaugural FIA championship of driver season in 1950. In fact, the Indy 500 was a part of the driver's championship for that first decade. And during that initial 10-year period, not many Formula 1 drivers actually went over across the Atlantic to the United States to race in the Indy 500. It required travel and many other logistical challenges. And from 1911 to 1988, only seven titles were taken by drivers under a flag other than the United States. This includes five of the first eight events. But the data would significantly change after 1989. Of the next 31 events that were held since, 23 drivers racing under non-American flags have won the illustrious event. This includes 12 of the most recent 15. But why did this happen? Let's find out, shall we? Chapter 1. The British Invasion Ironically, the first shift would occur after Formula 1 and the Indy 500 would loosen its connections. As we explore this path together, one thing I want you to be mindful of is the trend and the apparent motivations behind the drivers actually coming over to race in the Indy 500. Stick around to the end and we'll see how those drivers' motivations shift and why that matters. And the obvious must be stated. Prior to the Indy 500 actually leaving the calendar, the concept of the Triple Crown really couldn't exist. It's the very fact that none of the drivers actually competed in the Indy 500 that made the allure so strong later on. As the popularity and prestige began to blossom with the advancement of just motorsports in general, all disciplines were affected. A rising tide raises all ships, if you will. And the degree of difficulty to win these events, that grew exponentially with it. You could really no longer just hop in a car and win a race. Jim Clark's Indy 500 pursuits were more than likely driven by his passion for racing all types of cars, and less so out of the desire to be Triple Crown King. Because remember, this wouldn't carry the type of prestige it does today. It would take half a century of drivers failing to achieve this feat for it to hold the kind of glory it does today. Not to mention the pay for Formula 1 big names to come over at the time was quite large. As someone who was regularly involved in cross-discipline driving, Jackie Stewart was quoted as saying this, you can see it on screen. It was no secret that Jim Clark was considered by his peers as one of the best drivers to get behind the wheel. If he's within striking range, he's going to win. So to see him start P5 only to be runner-up was a very odd sight. Even more so to see him fail to capture the title from pole on his second attempt in 1964. But third time was the charm. And by now, the Oval had captured the attention of other big-name Formula 1 drivers. They wanted to see what all the fuss was about. But Jim Clark was not the first F1 champion to cross the Atlantic and try their hand at the 500 miles. 
The first driver to take their run at the Indy 500 was Alberto Ascari in 1952. Despite qualifying in 25th place with a lower qualifying speed, he'd make his way up to 9th place before he encountered a frozen wheel bearing, forcing him to spin out and retire from the race on lap 40. It wouldn't dissuade him though, and he'd go on to win every single championship event that season after his blow at the Indy 500. On top of that, he'd take every pole with it aside from one in Silverstone. And even further, he'd go on to win two consecutive championships. Seeing the strain that traveling to the US during the season put on Ascari in his championship contention, El Maestro wisely waited until his career was dwindling to try the 500 miles. And you have to remember, the FIA didn't sanction Formula 1 racing until after World War II. By then, Fangio would be well into his 40s by the time he won his first title. And while Ascari's Indy 500 was on the eve of his first title, Fangio's 1958 attempt was on the heels of his reign in F1. He dominated the 50s and won every single championship, aside from Ascari's double titles mentioned previously, from 1951 to 1957. But as it turns out, having Formula 1 hardware is not enough to promise you a good result in Indy. He'd meet a similar fate than Ascari, except worse. This car would fail to maintain the minimum speeds needed to run safely on the Indy Sunday. The lesson was clear. If you wanted to win at Indy, you better bring a powerful car with a good aero package, solid power, and most importantly, can go the distance. Jack Brabham would be next up. He would make his Indy debut as a two-time reigning F1 champion in 1961. Seeing as how this would coincide with the exit of the Indy 500 from the Formula 1 championships officially, I would mark this instance as the exact catalyst for other drivers racing in the event. The British Invasion, as it was dubbed, was accompanied with the arrival of the rear engine. Racing for the last time on the original bricks before the track was repaid following the 1961 season, Brabham would struggle to match the straight line speed, but had the advantage in the corners. His climb from P17 to P9 was respectable, but not a cakewalk. In comes 1963, and in comes Jim Clark. He was next up on another occasion the sitting F1 champion would race, but this time he was much more formidable. He would lose the race in controversial fashion, as Parnelli Jones would go on to win despite an oil leak that many thought should have been black flagged. Colin Chapman believed it was a bias against Jim Clark. Had it been an American in P2 behind Jones, he would have been shown the black flag. But the lack of action allowed Jones to take his first and only Indy 500 title. Clark's efforts earned him Rookie of the Year honors for the race. And in 1963, this would be the first time two Formula 1 champions would be in the field as Brabham was in the back finishing P20. But it wouldn't mark the last. Clark would appear in five straight events at Indy where he'd start the next three races, P1, P2, and P2 respectively. It's clear the 500 was important to him. He would go on to lose the 1964 championship to John Surtees and his Ferrari, as well as Graham Hill. So the following year, when he won in South Africa and elected to skip Monaco to race in Indy, it was a major risk. And at that time, only the best six events were scored for your championship tally. But the gamble would pay off, and he avenged his 1963 loss to Jones with the win in 1965, and he did it with the first rear engine in history of the Indy 500, as well as being the first non-American to win the race since 1916. After his success stateside, He'd go on a rampage, winning everything he touched, racking up five consecutive wins, effectively putting him out of reach of any other driver. As such, he'd be the only driver in history to win the Indy 500 and the World Drivers' Championship at the same time. That 1965 race was important also because of the inclusion of Mario Andretti, who finished P3 on his first attempt and was Rookie of the Year. Chapman and Andretti would first converge here as Mario's career was blossoming. The Lotus boss told Mario to call him when he was ready to race in Formula 1, which he would deliver on. Andretti was different than the other drivers mentioned so far in that he found success in open wheel racing in the US first, and then he went to Europe after. He'd proceed to win open wheel titles that year, and then he'd go on to defend his USAC championship in 1966. He'd further add to his titles at home with the Daytona 500 victory in 1967. He'd win yet another for STP the same year he'd finally claim his Indy 500 victory in 1969. Andretti's Formula 1 career peaked in the late 1970s as he'd take the Formula 1 title in 78. Over those next four seasons, he'd only podium two more times. He'd switch gears away from racing abroad and took the 1984 PPG IndyCar title. And despite sitting on the Formula 1 throne in 1978, he'd never actually win the Monaco Grand Prix, which is one of the key ingredients to the Triple Crown. What Andretti accomplished was unprecedented. It showed just how translatable driving skills are with the red right exposure. Gone are the days of such guest drives that Mario Andretti enjoyed from 1968 to 1974. What it did prove was that someone with an American open wheel title can find success in Formula 1, but the scheduling conflicts became more and more disruptive. This was no more evident by Andretti's F1 title year, when he had to fly back from Zolder. He missed qualifying and was forced to start dead last due to the driver change. Disappointed shortly, but it came with a nice treat. He got to unveil to the world the Lotus 79. 
a car that Andretti would prove to be lightning fast in. He'd go on to win Zolder in five of the next 11 races, and ultimately that 1978 title. Reinforcing this pattern was Mark Donahue. Donahue was an incredible driver whose life was tragically cut short racing, but by then it was clear he was special. He would give Penske their first Indy 500 title in 1972, as well as their first NASCAR win in the top division the following year, and he remains the last non-full-time driver to win a NASCAR Winston Cup road race. He and Andretti remain a good model for those drivers that start stateside and then move to Europe to race in Formula 1. Another less known driver that proved to be instrumental in showing the way for non-traditional paths to F1 was Peter Revson. Heir to the Revlon company, he left it all behind to pursue racing. And no, he didn't take some war chest. He literally lived in a van. He just loved racing that much. And he got his big break with Parnell, but it would evaporate right before his very eyes before he could even get going. Having chosen racing and being cut off from his family for doing so, he had no choice but to press on. That 1969 race would link all of these drivers together, where rookies Mark Donahue and Peter Revson would steal the show, along with veteran Dan Gurney. Revson would start plum last in 33rd and would work his way all the way up to P5. Controversially, Mark Donahue qualified 4th and finished P7, an impressive performance for sure, and it would earn him Rookie of the Year status. But not only did Revy work his way all the way back up, he famously did it in a highly underwhelming Brabham BT25. Revson and Donahue would trade impressive marks for the next few years at IMS, with Donahue taking runner-up in back-to-back -back years, ultimately to win his fourth attempt in 1972. And in 1971, he would actually lead the most amount of laps at 52. This would also be the year that Revy qualified on pole, but his car would fail him and Revy would go on to finish runner-up. It wasn't until after his Indy 500 success that Revson caught a break. He would partner former Formula 1 champion Denny Holm for the 1972 season at McLaren. He would take four podiums and finish P5 in the championship, despite missing a quarter of the season. That following season, he'd beat P5 in the championship again, but this time, he was 12 points ahead of Holm and taking two victories. And Holm's name was known for more than just Formula 1. Not only just for the fact that his name was a global motorsport namestay, but to racing fans stateside, his affiliation with Shelby Racing also was recognized. He was a close friend of Peter Revson, and much of what they did overlapped. 1967 was particularly almost a mega year for Holm. In the eyes of many, including myself, he and Ken Miles should have been crowned that 1966 Le Mans P5 class winner. They were famously snubbed after Carroll Shelby and Ken Miles capitulated to Ford, and he would dramatically slow down just so Ford could finish in victory formation for a photo finish. But it was the all-New Zealander number two car that were given the win on a technicality. Holm would win the 1967 Formula One championship in Monaco in the process. And after a P24 start at the 1967 Indianapolis 500, he would narrowly miss a win as he would finish P4. Despite falling just short, he and Donahue's Indy 500 Rookie of the Year in 1969 would close out that decade. While Fangio and Ascari issued the challenge to future Formula 1 drivers to prove their skill at Indy, the drivers of the 60s answered the call, and then some. Two Formula 1 drivers would actually go on to win the event. Four drivers that had their debut in Indy coming from F1 won Rookie of the Year. And even that stat is slightly diluted. The caveat being those rookie drives that overlaps. And it's now at this point we can talk about the second major shift in the story that emerged. Chapter 2. The Transportation Transformation. Both of the events would advance so much that it took so much out of you that it became very difficult to swing in the same weekend. So we began to see drivers that would spend some time in Formula 1 or in the FIA ladder, and they'd either go straight to kart before their Formula 1 drive could materialize, or they would rebound out of an F1 drive and into the open wheel series in America, which was, at the time, taking off. Excluding these early 70s duels between Mark Donahue and Peter Revson, as well as the on and off again success of Mario Andretti, which we've covered, the next two decades would see a few successes, but it would never be like it was in the 60s. But the names that showed up tended to stick around. A notable flop came at the hands of Clay Ragazzoni in 1977. It was proof that a Formula 1 driver couldn't just waltz over and pick up a quick win. After a big crash after pole day, he'd have his car in working order and get another chance on the third day. He was still racing in Monaco that year, but Andretti was quick enough on his first attempt that he didn't actually have to travel back to the States and run that weekend. Clay's performance in the early rounds trying to qualify for the event forced him to fly back and forth. He'd ultimately finish 30th from a fuel cell failure in the first bits. More serious contenders came at the hands of Teo Fabi and Roberto Guerrero, who won Rookie of the Year in 1983 and the 1984 races respectively. Danny Sullivan's 1985 win would cap a string of three consecutive strong results from drivers that come from the Formula 1 series. That 1983 season that Bobby put together in kart would prove what many knew about his driving skills. He would also be the first rookie to take pole at the Indianapolis 500 since 1950. Unfortunately, he'd be the perfect case study for why drivers should never split time. 
His 83 kart season wooed F1 constructors back around, and he'd get a seat, but unfortunate to him, it was next to reigning champion Nelson Piquet, and due to the factors we've already mentioned, his performance would suffer as he was racing in both kart and in Europe. Following a series of unforgettable performances, he would wisely devote all of his time and attention back into F1, which was his priority, and he'd pick up a podium, a P4, and a P5 finish. While Guerrero had much less success in F1, he would go on to have some noteworthy finishes at the Indy 500, taking top four finishes on his first four attempts. And as for Danny Sullivan, he would attract the attention of Tyrrell, who capitulated to Benetton, who wanted an American driver in the seat for 1983. And prior to taking up that seat, he had driven in the lower form of the series in Europe. After finishing in the points just twice, he'd return to kart where he'd land on his feet, picking up a couple wins immediately. And his P4 finish in the championship would have earned him Rookie of the Year, except he had drove in a few races in 1982 prior to racing for Tyrrell, though Guerrero would take the honors that year. And while Danny spun his wheels in F1, he'd go on to deliver one of the most famous moments in the history of the Indy 500 just two years after his forgettable F1 debut. And his name was cemented with another spin, but this time it would have a good association in his legendary 1985 spin and win drive at Indy. After three top five finishes and a P9, he would finally win his kart title in 1969. He would go on later in 2002 to play an instrumental role in finding American drivers in the Red Bull search program. Emerson Fittipaldi would be at the forefront of another major change in motorsport, and his 1989 title cemented this. After 11 seasons, 14 wins, two titles, and 281 points in F1, the Brazilian made a name for himself in kart, returning to professional racing after four years off. His Penske PC-17 would be the spark that brought Emerson back to his winning form. In 1989, he'd take five victories, including his first Indianapolis 500, on his way to his 1989 kart championship. This, combined with kart joining the Automobile Competition Committee for the United States, or simply ACCUS, marked the key moments that would really appear to be a major change in the series. The ACCUS was the liaison to American Motorsport for the FIA. With this, drivers now had a way to protect their super licenses. Eddie Cheever would be the next established name to leave F1 for American open wheel racing, and at this point, the trend is becoming more apparent as F1 drivers are finding the racing enjoyable and the cars very quick. Cheever would make for yet another impressive rookie performance at the Indianapolis 500 in 1990, and after his move from the IRL IndyCar series over to kart, he'd set up his own team and win the Indianapolis 500 driving his own car for his team in 1998. In just a few short years after Fittipaldi's title, another Formula 1 champion came over, and this time making more headlines. Mansell would carry all of that momentum he had from the 1992 championship in Formula 1 over into his Indy drive where he'd also win the kart championship in 1983. He'd be the only driver to simultaneously hold both series titles. And upon the exit of one Formula 1 champion came the entrance of a future Formula 1 champion in Jacques Villeneuve. His rookie season was incredibly successful as he would win Rookie of the Year in both the Indy 500 and the series championship. He'd follow that up with another memorable moment at the Indy 500 in 1995 with his famous Indy 505 win where he'd be given an early two-lap penalty for accidentally passing the pace car only to storm back to win. It was just the confidence that Villeneuve needed and one that Williams did not ignore. He would continue his tradition of only needed one year to acclimate before he'd win the series title. Villeneuve jumped ship at just the right time. Racing in America would split months after that Indy 500. It became increasingly more rare for drivers to transition across the Atlantic. Eddie Cheever's 1997 title was the last for nearly two decades for a driver to spend any large amount of time in F1 to win at the Indianapolis 500. But it certainly wasn't the last. Chapter 3. The Turn of the Century between the year 2000 and 2020, there have been four championships from drivers who have spent time in Formula 1. Juan Pablo Montoya in 2000, followed up again by JPM in 2015, Alexander Rossi in 2016, and Takuma Sato in 2017. Both of those Indy 500s in 2000 and 2016 were noteworthy, because both victories were at the hands of first-time contenders. And Graham Hill's 1966 Indy 500 win marks just the third time that an F1 driver on his rookie performance had actually won the event. Now that may sound pretty unimpressive, but when you actually look at the numbers, it's quite shocking, especially given this has only happened 10 times in over 100 years of the event being held. And only twice more was a former F1 driver given the honors. And this was in 2012 with Rubens Barrichello getting P11 and Fernando Alonso's P24 in 2017. That 2017 Indy 500 would be the last time since 1993 that foreign born drivers would sweep the top three. And before that, it had been since 1915. Montoya's impressive rookie victory was a controversial one that came down to the wire, ultimately ending in a 212-point deadlock with Dario Franchitti. 
and the resulting tiebreaker fell in the rookie's favor as he had won seven races to Dario's three. And what Dario and JPM share is time spent excelling in the karting series. His earliest major bright spot was his awarding of the prestigious Autosport BRDC award. But not all lower formula success is from drivers that come from European countries. Another driver who has found a tremendous degree of success at the Indy 500 also has ties to British Formula 3 racing, and that's none other than Helio Castroneves. Like Frankitti, Castroneves is among an elite group of three times Indy 500 champions. And also like Dario, he showed pace in British Formula 3, but doing one better placing P3 in 1995 by way of six podiums with a win at Donington Park. Furthermore, and consistent with the theme, while the two latest Indy 500 champions don't have Formula 1 experience, Will Power and Simon Paginal have raced together in 2005 in the inaugural Renault 3.5 series, placing 7th and 6th respectively. Another name that has graced the Indy 500 champions list is Tony Kanaan, who has been on the scene since his splash in Indy Lights, claiming runner-up in just his first attempt then winning in the following year. But even before that, he'd have a very impressive showing in Italian Formula 3. His respectable 9 podiums would put him at a P5 finish. And it wasn't as if the Italian Formula 3 series wasn't attracting names at that point. He had just barely missed Giancarlo Fisichella, who had won the 1994 Italian F3 title by a landslide. And Fisichella would have to be patient about his own career, as he'd have to wait for the right car to finally make his mark. This wouldn't occur until his breakout season in 03 when he switched from the uncompetitive Jordan. The uninspired pace of that 2002 car proved to be equally uneventful for his rookie teammate, who happened to be Takuma Sato. Sato comes from a surprisingly long and low-key F1 career, where he'd be known for his no-surrender driving style. And this is evident by his 7 full seasons and 44 points, where he'd once stand on the podium with the Ferrari pair, despite his underwhelming car. The pace he had shown throughout his F1 career would prove to translate, and this was most true in his third attempt at the Indy 500 where he'd make a last lap move for the win. It didn't actually pan out, but it was commendable nonetheless. Enter 2007, when all eyes were on Fernando Alonso, but Sato wouldn't be denied, and he'd take his first Indianapolis 500 victory. And it wasn't easy, but he was clearly up to the task. And this time, it was Max Chilton who was making things difficult. And this is relatively unsurprising considering he had just come from the turbo hybrid era in Formula 1 in a backmarker car where you had to earn every single inch. Interestingly, Chilton would lead the most amount of laps at 50. This is nearly double the amount of laps of the next driver. Chilton left F1 at the same time as the 2016 rookie Alexander Rossi. And what some may not know about Rossi was that he was relatively on form in 2015. He was beating his teammate there at the end of the season, matching his team's highest finish that season, just outside the top 10 in his third start. The team would decide to clean house for the 2016 season. Meanwhile, Rossi would have his eyes set on America, and he'd sign with Andretti Autosport, and the rest is history. He would later be offered back that full-time seat, but would decline, which makes perfect sense considering he would go on to win the Indy 500 on his first attempt. For someone quoted about their hesitance to oval racing, at least at IMS, Rossi has found a great deal of comfortability, as he's yet to finish an Indy 500 outside of the top 10. And even more recently, Marcus Ericsson makes his full-time indie debut in 2019 after five seasons in F1. And in this current 2020 season ahead of the Indianapolis 500, he sits in 8th place. And while this list is meant to be exhaustive, I'm sure I've missed some drivers. And that's kind of the point. There are so many drivers that have come from different levels of success across different series that, once they get to Indy, it's no longer as simple as saying they're this kind of driver, they're that kind of driver. But if you want to check some of the underlying data, you can check a link in the description. That'll send you to a shared file which catalogs all the information I was pulling to make this video. And this brings us back to Fernando Alonso, the two-time Formula 1 world champion. His return to the show in Indy looks a lot more like what we saw from drivers like Ascari, Clark, Stewart, and even into the 70s with the late Peter Revson. There was, once upon a time, a greater degree of fluidity across motorsport disciplines, and it was significantly easier to move around. That time has passed. It's possible, but the door is closing. And the Indy 500 is such a prolific event, drivers will rearrange their entire careers just to win it. And it's pretty clear, Alonso has done just that. And if anything, I see that as a tip of the hat to IndyCar. But again, Alonso is the exception, and we may not get a chance to watch a Triple Crown take place again. As someone with deep stock and American open wheel roots, but also as someone who has based my entire career and adult life to covering Formula 1, I have a foot in both camps. I would love nothing more than to bridge that gap of these two motorsports. It's a race that requires respect. And there's drivers across, well, any category that will agree. There's reasons why there are so few Triple Crown winners. One, in fact. All that said, Fernando Alonso aims to double that exclusive club's membership to a grand total of two. And if he's going to do it, he'll have to have a clinical drive, putting on a show for everyone starting from P26. And what better place to do it than the show itself? We could be looking at an historic event play out right before our very own eyes. 
and my only objective is to get as many motorsport enthusiasts to watch the event and be sure not to miss what could be the last winner of the Triple Crown. In worst case, if you're mostly an F1 fan at least, you'll get a glimpse at a different kind of racing style, but world class driving all the same. And if you found this video interesting, subscribe for more deep dives and interesting motorsport stories. Also share with any IndyCar fans or another F1 fan who may find this interesting. So be sure to mark your calendars. August 23rd could be that fateful day. And having said that, now stay tuned for the greatest spectacle in racing. And I'll see you very, very soon.